It's pretty universally acknowledged that the bar, that is, the collective noun for a gaggle of attorneys, has a problem with alcohol and substance abuse. I know, I know, we've all been told that dentists and cab drivers are the most unhappy careers, but I think we need to toss attorneys into that mix. What we don't talk about and acknowledge is that law school ruins eyeballs. Looking between our incoming class photo and photos from my 3L year, I clocked a lot of newly framed faces. I went the opposite direction. I went from wearing glasses to wearing contacts. I was wildly transparent about my experience trying to find out how to put in my contacts and taking a whopping 45 minutes each morning and needing help getting a contact out because I couldn't quite grasp it. The process to get to the fairly standard and normal routine I have now, as you may have put together, was not without bumps. The most significant bump, however, took place at the very beginning, in my optometrist's office. Vaguely, medical places turned me into an 18th century swooner in need of a fainting couch, and when the optometrist brought me over to a backless stool near a well-lit mirror so I could learn how to put my new lenses in, I recognized my telltale signs of an incoming faint and explained I needed a moment on the couch across the room. But the internal light switch went out before I got there, and I broke the bottom pane of a glass door with my head on the way down. I came to with the sound of falling glass gently tinkling around me and missing a small clump of my hair. Then, in the haze of my concussion, the optometrist asked me to sign a hurriedly typed up agreement that I wouldn't sue. As I signed the document, I distinctly remember thinking that I didn't believe there was a court in the land that would find that document enforceable, given my head injury moments before. But my ability or inability to think through both contracts and torts, whether the optometrist owed me some duty of care or whether the reasonable optometrist would keep backless stools in their practice, That thought process required high-level analysis. It wasn't something straightforward. But after getting his bell rung, Army Ranger Specialist Byrne claimed the hit was so severe he couldn't appreciate or understand that beating someone to death was wrong. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. In July 2021, 41-year-old Denise Smith accepted a job working security in a downtown building located along 9th Street in Tacoma, Washington. Denise worked her first handful of shifts without incident and arrived the night of July 17th for a night shift. Some sources described this as her second or third day on the job. At around 6 a.m. on July 18th, the co-worker who showed up to provide her relief and send her home instead discovered her limp body and summoned police. When police arrived, they found Denise severely beaten and lying face down in a pool of blood. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Nearby, they found the access-controlled door propped open, a black face mask, and cell phones. Investigators pulled surveillance from the office building Denise worked in. It should perhaps come as no surprise that a building splashing out for overnight security personnel has also invested in cameras around the property. Cameras showed Denise leave the building in the early morning hours to speak with an unhoused woman who was using the fountain in front of the building to bathe. Denise returned to the building and 26-year-old Army Ranger Specialist Patrick Philip Byrne approached the door between 1 and 2 a.m. Denise tried to shoo him along his way, but he didn't leave. She opened the door, perhaps to better communicate that the building was closed, and Byrne pushed past her into the building. 
Byrne had been out drinking with his buddies that night at the office bar and grill. They had returned to Joint Base Lewis McCord, JBLM, either two weeks or two months earlier following either a one- or two-month deployment to Afghanistan. The reporting, as you might have picked up, was inconsistent on this detail, even though it seems like it'd be a verifiable one. And I'll level with you, legal beagles. At least once a quarter, I remark to someone that large, roving packs of unsupervised men stress me out. There's something about a group like that that feels untethered and volatile. Byrne and his buddies were not an exception to my admittedly sexist rule. While they were out drinking, Byrne got wrapped up in a bar fight and was punched in the face. He fell and hit his head against concrete. He was briefly unconscious, though it's unclear how long he was out. Bar fight aside, I do think this would be a particularly rowdy group to run into. Byrne himself was an army ranger. Army rangers are special operations forces and specialize in combat missions inside enemy territory. They're trained to conduct those missions using a variety of weapons and receive substantial training in hand-to-hand combat that combines techniques from wrestling, boxing, Muay Thai, Judo, and Kali. Following the brawl and his brief bout of unconsciousness, Byrne left the bar seeking a different environment. Within minutes of regaining consciousness, he came across Denise. The Daily Mail, and seemingly only the Daily Mail, suggest that Byrne pushed past Denise because he believed that another person involved in the bar fight had entered the building and was hiding in there. Whatever his motivation for gaining entry, he snapped. I'm going to detail the attack, so if you'd prefer to skip this portion, I'd scrub ahead about 60 seconds. The surveillance footage showed Byrne first slamming Denise to the ground before unleashing a beating that lasted nearly ten minutes. During the violent attack, Byrne dragged Denise by her hair braids, beat her with his fists, stabbed her in the face with her own keys, and then attempted to use the keys to gouge out her eyes. Denise stood about a foot shorter than Byrne, and she repeatedly tried to flee from him, but he prevented her escape snatching her and dragging her back. At one point, she made a dash for the elevator, but didn't make it. Eight minutes after the beating began, he flipped Denise over and began to choke her. Initially, she kicked back, trying to break free, but she stopped moving and went limp after about a minute. Byrne continued to choke her for at least another minute. She was described as unrecognizable because of the brutality Byrne unleashed. Following that beating, Byrne's rage wasn't yet spent, and he entered a nearby conference room where he started throwing furniture around. He tried to use a chair to smash out a window, but was unsuccessful. Byrne re-entered the lobby and began throwing things around there as well. Then he exited the building through the propped open door, walked to a landing, and either fell or jumped 14 feet to the ground below, injuring himself in the process. Surveillance showed Byrne lying on the concrete floor below the landing for at least a few minutes. At about 2 a.m., Byrne came to and began screaming for help, telling bystanders he'd been stabbed. He was covered in blood, which bystanders and first responders initially assumed was his. A stabbing made sense. Bystanders called for emergency services, and he was taken to a hospital. There, he told the staff that he'd been stabbed and sexually assaulted. It was easy for hospital personnel to confirm that Byrne had not been stabbed, but he refused a rape exam. I hate this detail. I would love to point to this decision in order to say, look, he's aware of what's going on around him. He's aware that he doesn't want to endure a safe exam, a sexual assault forensic exam, with the collection of samples, swabs, and photographs. 
I really want to point at this and say he didn't want to endure the discomfort of the exam because he was lying and he knew it. The tension for me is that there are a lot of reasons legitimate victims of assault do not want to sit for a safe exam. Practitioners do a lot to avoid re-traumatizing a victim when they have to, for example, swab sensitive areas. But everyone's trauma and experience is different. Critically, the exam model is built around consent. It gives survivors the control because they didn't have it during their assault. And if a survivor declines the exam for their personal reasons that I cannot possibly understand, I'm not going to be the one to say that we should use that as evidence that they were not assaulted. So with that tension in mind, what I can say is that because he declined a safe exam, there was no evidence that Byrne was sexually assaulted, nor was there evidence of being stabbed. We don't know what prompted him to make those claims. That is, we don't know whether it was a drunken lie, a concussion claim, or a self-interested cover story. He said and now maintains that he has no memory of the night between the bar and the hospital. The people of the state of Washington charged Byrne with first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and first-degree burglary. In March 2024, Byrne, still an active-duty soldier, pled guilty for beating and choking Denise to death. In his court filings, he indicated that he was accepting the plea in order to spare her loved ones the pain of a full trial. In exchange for his plea agreement, the people dropped the burglary and kidnapping charges. At his sentencing hearing, Byrne tried to apologize to Denise's family. To his apology, he added the explanation that he was not a drunken, monstrous murderer. He explained, or tried to explain, that he wasn't a threat to society. And then he reminded the court that he still could not recall any details from Denise's death. His attorney argued that Byrne's history of head injuries culminating in that punch to the head and collision with concrete at the bar before he killed Denise diminished his capacity and culpability. Specifically, Byrne argued that the head injury rendered him unconscious and not legally responsible. To support this contention, he relied on the location of a brain bleed identified following the murder. It was in a portion of the brain that controls morality and judgment. Byrne previously suffered what appears to be a number of head injuries. Some of them were related to his service. Some were related to car wrecks. Plural. His service-related injuries included a blast concussion and a major fall after his parachute failed to deploy. For more information about the dangers of jumping out of planes with a poorly packed parachute, I'd encourage you to listen to Episode 8, The Herman Case. Six of Denise's family members spoke during the sentencing hearing, and her loved ones filled the courtroom, at least one bearing a photo of the woman they loved and missed. Byrne received the lightest sentence allowable for first-degree murder in Washington, a sentence of 20 years in prison. While handing down the sentence, the court told Byrne that his actions were as callous and cruel as the court had ever had the misfortune of dealing with, but that there may be some merit to his diminished capacity claim. Whatever weight the court gave to that argument, it also highlighted that, of all the people involved in the case, Byrne was the only one that knew he had a history of head injuries and that he made the conscious choice to get intoxicated to the point of engaging in a bar fight. Following his sentencing, the army began the process of separating Byrne. I haven't yet seen an appellate brief filed by Byrne. I would anticipate that if and when he does appeal, it will be on a claim that the court did not adequately consider his asserted diminished capacity the night of the murder, and argue instead that Byrne is guilty of a lesser-included offense. 
That said, I'm uncertain which division of the Washington Court of Appeal would handle it. Division 2 of the court sits in Tacoma and would ordinarily hear his appeal. But the office building that Denise guarded, the office building where Denise was murdered, houses Division 2 of the Washington Court of Appeal. The elevator she tried to escape to opens into their lobby. I could see a world in which they elect to transfer the case to a different division for disposition. I'll keep an eye out, and if Washington files an appellate opinion about Byrne, I'll probably update you over on Instagram. Until then, I'll leave you with the prosecutor's reminder that cases like this don't end with winners, just different people who own a piece of the sadness. Although there's not yet an appeal, I think it makes sense to focus today's discussion on head injuries as a legal defense. Byrne argued through his criminal defense counsel that his history of head injuries may have led to diminished capacity. He argued that a brain scan supported that theory, that Byrne had a brain bleed in the area that controls morality and judgment. A traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is an injury to the brain caused by an outward force. This outward force is most often a blow to the head or a violent movement of the head. Many TBIs are caused by vehicle crashes, falls, sport injuries, and, most pertinent to service members, explosions or impacts. Not everyone who experiences a TBI even realizes they have one. The Centers for Disease Control estimates 1.7 million people suffer from TBIs annually. On the mild side of TBIs are concussions. Concussions don't usually result in persistent symptoms or long-term risks and account for about 75% of the annual TBI injuries. Approximately 10% of the annual TBI injuries are classified as severe, which leaves about 15% that fall somewhere in between. From the year 2000 to the year 2017, more than 375,000 service members were diagnosed with traumatic brain injuries, often from proximity to explosions or combat. Our brains are not meant to pinball around in our noggins, Once a TBI is inflicted, it can manifest as nausea, dizziness, constant headaches, slurred speech, sensitivity to light, loss of consciousness, seizures, difficulty with relationships, mood swings or personality changes, depression, and motor impairment. The most serious and severe TBIs can result in comas and vegetative states. Most relevant to Byrne and the assertions he made at his sentencing hearing, are the ways that brain injuries can interact with decision-making. I think Burns' claimed memory loss, while interesting, is a bit of a red herring. Whether Byrne remembers killing Denise is, in many ways, irrelevant. What matters is whether Byrne knew what he was doing, and whether he appreciated that what he was doing was wrong. A brain injury can disrupt the complex process of decision-making, but symptoms vary by patient. Bear with me, but I am going to use the Cheesecake Factory menu to explain my point. Some people living with symptoms of a TBI find simple decisions almost impossible to make. They could sit for an hour with the extensive Cheesecake Factory menu and come to no decisions. Others become impulsive, making hasty decisions without thinking them through. They might order a small plate and appetizer, an entree, and a slice of cheesecake without considering that they've ordered enough food to feed five people. A diminished capacity defense based on a traumatic brain injury argues that the injury to the brain was such that the defendant was not capable of forming the required mens rea. There are two pieces to each crime the actus reus, and the mens rea. The actus reus is the physical act. Here, it would be Byrne's brutal beating and strangulation of Denise. 
The mens rea is the mental state. There are three theories of first-degree murder in Washington state. First, premeditated murder. Second, felony murder, that is, the death occurs during the commission of a felony, such as rape, robbery, burglary, kidnapping, or arson. Or third, an extreme indifference to human life. The last piece is most relevant to Byrne, though it occurs to me that perhaps the kidnapping and burglary charges were a felony murder fail-safe option. It's engaging in an act that has an unusually high risk of death, and it functionally equates ignoring the risk of death involved in those dangerous behaviors with plotting a murder. It's the law saying you obviously knew better and chose to do it anyway. So if we distill Burns' TBI argument down to something directly applicable to this theory of first-degree murder, it's this. He was so out of his mind because of his head injury that he couldn't manifest that extreme indifference to human life. If his argument was successful, it wouldn't make Byrne not guilty of killing Denise, but it might make him guilty instead of a lesser-included offense. To support his argument, Byrne presented evidence from two doctors that said that the brain bleed was from the fight, that is, that it was from before Byrne killed Denise. As you all know, I am not a doctor of bodies, I am only a doctor of laws. I think it's a tall order to prove that this brain bleed was a result of the punch to the face and fall to the ground, and not the 14-foot fall to the ground after the murder. The brain scan wasn't from directly after the murder. It was from after Byrne fell 14 feet, called out for help, made false reports of a stabbing and sexual assault, and went to the hospital for treatment. The court's comments at sentencing seem to equate this brain injury defense with a voluntary intoxication defense, because the judge started with the observation that Byrne chose to get drunk enough to engage in fisticuffs. The head injury that followed, be it from the fight or the fall, perhaps seemed the likely outcome from the decision to drink that heavily. I do see the appeal of a diminished capacity claim if for no other reason than the fact that there is no easily discernible reason for Byrne to murder Denise. He truly had nothing to gain. He had no clear motive for brutalizing her. Although it is undisputed that Byrne killed Denise, this would have been a challenging case to try because of that diminished capacity or incapacity argument. The defense wouldn't need to convince every juror that the brain injury affected Byrne's decision-making. They would only need to convince one. And I think the risk is high in taking the case like this to trial. And even though I just said that I do understand the appeal of a diminished capacity claim, I can't help but look at the other side of the scale. Byrne was trained in hand-to-hand combat and was all hopped up, from a fight in which he didn't have the advantage. A fight where he'd been knocked down and out. Denise was a foot shorter than him, and perhaps he didn't feel like picking on someone his own size as an outlet for his ensuing rage. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when we take a peek at post-separation employment opportunities and plans. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct and Becoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.